it's preparing a live stream. This is the bit that, um, let me see. The meeting is being live streamed. Thank you. Got it. Yes, I have. Thank you. So now what we do is it just take a couple of seconds. I'll just go onto my Facebook page and see if it's there. Okay. And then I'll share it now. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well. Just bear with me. You know, I'm old and it takes me a while to sort these things. There we are. The sword of truth and dealing dealing with duality. So if I click on that. There we are. So, well, hello there. There's Denise Chadwick. She's always keeping an eye on me. She, yeah, she corrects me a lot. She's like my mother or big sister or young sister. I've already got into trouble. <laughs> Siobhan, it's lovely to see you and it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, Likewise. It's only a few weeks, really, since we've been in contact for the first time, I think. And um, I, I'd not met you before. I'd not heard about you before, you know. So that's the way I sort of like it, you know, because I think things just turn up at the right time for the right reason. That's the way my sort of life works these days. And, you know, you, you sent me some stuff to read, which, which um, the stuff I read, I really enjoyed. And I've got a feeling that we're probably on the same wavelength. Yes. We are. So, so just quickly, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us, they say in Liverpool, what's your name and where'd you come from, number two? So uh, my there you go. Siobhan Nicolau, and I come from uh, California. Right. I love California. I've been to California a couple of times. Um, I stayed in Los Angeles and I moved around. And my favorite place, or one of them, is Santa Monica. I loved it there. It's gorgeous in Los Angeles, yeah, it is. So you're from California, and I believe you're in Boston now? Yes, I'm on the East Coast. I love New England for lots of reasons. I'm trying to figure out how to get the two combined, you know, California and New England, but I think it's just a matter of going between the two. <laughs> yeah. Is it a long way from one to the other? Because I'm not, I'm not really up on the geography of... Um... No, not really at all. It's uh, probably, what, five and a half, six hours going one way and maybe six and a half coming the other. So almost as much as it is to get to England or Rome. Right. And um, I believe you've been about a bit. Don't take that the wrong way, but, you know... <laughs> about a bit, but yeah. around the planet, you mean. Yeah, yeah, you've been around a bit, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I have. I have been. I love it. Yeah. Didn't a lot of traveling in the, uh, um, I like to travel but a lot in the earlier years um, before everything got organized, which is really nice. You know, I tell my daughter how blessed we were to travel before things really got organized. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, the stuff that you sent me that I read, um, as I was reading it, I can see that from a, from my point of view, a male point of view, we've been through similar principles, really. I mean, one of the strongest influences for me was my upbringing in the Catholic faith. Yes. You know, and I had a very, very strong, well, in fact, it was my mum's birthday yesterday. I think that you saw her picture on the on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And my mum, she was the person that I've loved with all my heart most and hated with all my heart most, you know. And I think that probably we'll get talking about um, maybe strong minded mothers and the way that they've influenced us or me, you know, because what I used to do was I used to, um, if I had any ideas, I would run them past my mother. And this was probably the first response. <laughs> Oh, we weren't even allowed to speak them. So, you know. <laughs> oh, weren't you? Yeah. And I do a, I do a talk, you know, and uh, my field sort of medicine and biomedicine. I yeah. do a talk. I do a talk called um, The Mummy's Curse, I call it. You know? Oh, that's good. And, yeah, and, 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 I, and I do it from a sort of lighthearted point of view. But as most people know me, um, my lightheartedness has always got a punch somewhere in it, you know. And yeah. the talk is basically about how how my mum's influence on my life, right, really steered me away from who I really was, you know. So maybe we'll we'll get on to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And where it's led me, and maybe this is all part of what they call the soul's purpose or the soul's journey or the soul's exploration. I don't really fully know about that. 
but at one level I do feel that it was all for a purpose you know what 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 do you think well there's many different interpretations of that very thing for me uh, I would have never dreamed my path would take me to be so passionate about transforming um, back into light the emotional body which I then I discovered subsequently transforms the physical body because itself and then as more consciousness uh, begins to vibrate within my physical body and the more consciousness that I continue to evolve into within myself um, you know I'm pretty much on the path of thinking I can vaporize this life rather than have to allow the physical body to die and I have nothing to lose and all I've gained is myself so it's about turning matter into spirit for me and I've found that it's pretty effective from the inside out um, there's a lot in the book that's not mentioned believe it or not and uh, you know I look at myself then and I look at myself now and I consider myself living proof of the, that this works because what we what I have discovered uh, through people have this concept of love they're not familiar with the consciousness of it and if they are it's usually from something external and when I discovered the consciousness in love within me and started using that as the uh, tool to transform the duality in me which is the negative emotion that creates it then everything started to really change um, I think that's the real real clincher is that um, it really is from the inside out and taking personal responsibility for that is is uh, a problem for a lot of people they won't do it um i was i would kind of get all over the place sometimes one thing one thing i wanted to ask you about uh is that you have in your own practice it's called internal asset management is that correct yeah yeah okay and, and that's about hacking physi uh, physiology physical to change the psychology or the mental okay and so you being a doctor of psychology um i've got a phd in medicine i'm not a doctor mm -hmm. of medicine i'm a doctor in medicine but my okay. my, my first degree was biomedical sciences so oh, i'm quite au fait cool. with you know pathology and multidisciplinary approaches to mm -hmm. biochemistry medical microbiology hematology all those sorts of things so that gave me a good grounding really if you like in the biomedical sciences oh, and then cool. i went on a 15-year journey then uh, into the dark side you know as we have to you know and then i sort of looked at the uh, the other side of me uh, that i was completely hiding away from really uh, and it's similar to your story really and i think mm -hmm. for a purpose i had to sort of face my shadow self and accept it bit by bit until it sort of incorporated itself into a whole a more whole person you know because i do feel that there's always things to learn there's always you know there's always more evolution and growth at a deeper level you know so oh, where right. i'm up to you know i think hacking physiology to change psychology what that means is uh, i feel that the heart is at the core of this transformative process you know and i talk about the heart of hearts and mm -hmm. if i was going to use a, a term that would be where my soul is really and i think once uh, once people get in touch with this soul consciousness i think that uh, as far as my work goes anyway they start to feel something emerging from deep within them you know and what i try and help people is to metaphorically help them to decapitate themselves because that's the past really as far as i'm concerned all the memory is basically from the past and most of the time people just link into memory and, li and live their life just from a, a repeated things that they've done before so i think where where we are now or where i am is i don't need to learn i don't need to live off that sort of patterning or template from the past i just do what, what emerges and comes up from my heart next and then i take yeah. action and and then on that one i call that acting upon information received and it depends where the information comes from and for me and you've used the word that's from unconditional love and to me, that means that there's something deep within me, higher than me, deeper than me, that knows best for me. And if I can tune into that and listen to its instructions and follow them, then my life becomes better. Yeah, that will lead to knowing yourself as being nothing but love. And that's the big part of the game that people don't realize. They're constantly pushing away and dividing continually to not be what they don't want to be, but in that it's a judgment. And so that's why the titled my book is The Absence of Evil because there is not one part of myself in my history, which has been pretty interesting in my soul journey, 
that I haven't reclaimed or that I haven't been able to face, that I wasn't able to be the unwavering presence of love long enough for it to surrender to become the truth of itself. And so it's, you know, compartmentalizing never worked for me because it, it, it vibrates too greatly within my experience. My depth of feeling is, is really deep. And so things tend to get my attention. Uh, and, and when I feel the frequency of awareness vibrating on something within me, uh, it can become pretty large within me. So then there's the process of um, being the love that I am within the body where this is vibrating. And it's almost like, I call it nuclear for me now, because it's like this atom bomb of, of transformation that happens within me. And it's intense. And then you get up and boom, you got five minutes. But um, yeah, the process uh, to learning how to love yourself is to see yourself as a love you are. And this is a whole thing that has to change within the, the way people speak about love uh, in spiritual practices. You already are that. And to, to go from that premise is to always know that everything you've been and everything that you are is always in the process of becoming. Like you say, it never ends. We get better at the deeper levels of what emerges to, you know, to be more of that love for ourselves. Um, what I've also discovered too in this work is that um, uh, the heart itself is in the mental body. And so that is divided as well. How we've been taught to love is through uh, religious conditioning. We should, we have to, um, you know, we, we see people in lack and give to them rather than s supporting their prosperity. We're, you know, so the heart can be very much divided. And so when people say, I go to the heart and I love myself, it, it feels to me in a lot of cases, and, uh, you know, uh, sounds like you've been doing this for quite a while. So I'm sure this has evolved from the simplistic way you uh, described it. But um, is it that they go to the heart and they say that it's love and it's enough, but the most of the emotional energy within the physical body is below the line of the solar plexus. And this is where people avoid being in their bodies. It, you know, um, we have everything, Dr. Joe, we have everything at our disposal these days to absolutely transform into being, into this light that we are, into this consciousness that we are. Um, we're so blessed in that way to uh, have so much at our disposal. I think the only thing that's tripping up humanity is their actual willingness to love themselves <laughs> and learn what that means. <laughs> well, I, I agree. And I, and I do think, and um, in 2011, I was sort of inspired from within, if you like. And this is what happens to me. I just get a whole, probably the same as yourself. I get yeah. a whole flush. I get a whole flush of thinking. And I think, well, what's what's all that about? You know, and um, I sort of have to sit with it. And I almost like say to myself, I say heart, but I mean heart of heart and something much deeper than that, really. Yeah. I, I, I sit with it and I just say, can you give this to me in little short bursts so I can try and get my head around it? And I got, you need to go out there and tell people about the great shift in consciousness. I said, because this time I talk, right? I said, that's very kind of you. Thanks very much. What the hell is the great shift in consciousness? Because <laughs> I didn't have a clue, you know. And so I've learned, like you, that it's all about mind. It's all mind. It's all about con consciousness. I'm calling it conscientiousness now as well, because I think yeah. that's part of the transformative process that people are going through. But go and tell them, Joe, and I think, oh, God, hang on. Let me find out a bit about it first. And within six months, I was traveling all over the country, giving talks on the shift in consciousness or the great shift or the great awakening or whatever. Yes. And honestly, Siobhan, before that, I didn't have a bloody clue. I'd never heard of it. Right. I know I knew what it was because I'd gone through the process myself. So it was almost like feeling my way putting words on it and, and my thing is to try and use ordinary words rather than be sort of I mean I do like things because people say to me what are you a consultant in and I say oh, it's quite simple really psycho neuro endocrino immuno hematology right and then they, <laughs> <laughs> then they don't ask me anything it is well, what's that it's just like what's going on between your head how it affects your body and vice versa and they go oh why didn't you say that you know so the thing about it is I was talking about this great shift in consciousness and I yeah. got the date, you know, 21st of the 12th and, and, and all that sort of business. And I've got to be honest, you know, most of the information that comes to me until it's out of my mouth and being expressed, I don't really fully understand what it means. So I get like learning on the run, really. 
used mm-hmm. to call it when we had a chalkboard. It's mm-hmm. almost like I'd be chalking, and it was like automatic writing coming out, and I'd be looking at it, thinking, "Oh, right, <laughs> see what that means now," you know. So I don't know. I don't. I'm. I'm like you. I go off into all sorts of different places. But where I'm at is hacking physiology. I think that I'm trying to help people move beyond psychology because I think psychology is a trap in the way that it's taught. I think we can obviously, we can cognitively reframe things if if it stops the process and takes us deeper. But, you know, a fifth of our processing goes on below, uh, above the iceberg. And it's all those four fifths below the iceberg that really determine and motivate our behavior. You know, and what I'm trying to help people with is mindful breathing to, first of all, allow a stop to take place and then help them to breathe in a certain way. So it creates some more mind space for this emergence of what they need to know. So if you want to call mm-hmm. that inner t- intuition or inner teaching or whatever. So over to you. Well, getting people out of the way and teaching them how to be out of the mind. They talk about my mindfulness and I say, no, it's mindlessness. That's actually the key for me. <laughs> Don't think <laughs> and, and, and learn to feel, learn to be in this, in the presence of your being. And when, you know, we show people how to manage their energy instead of letting it just drift out of the body all the time, because it's so, it was so interesting when it occurred to me that we have this beautiful spirit that lives within the form and gives us life life every day it's connected to a you know silver cord in our solar plexus and ever since we were small it was we were never taught that it literally belonged below our feet and so what it does is it drives all of our light and attention up to the mental and spiritual bodies and we're daydreaming and floating around and we give it no direction and so it's like a child that's never been taught when to go to bed at night or a child that's never been coached or encouraged it's just a wild doing anything and so spirit will drag you around forever until you learn how to work with it below your feet you're changing an entire program i mean each step that we take in this work that i show people how to do is changing the program it's no little thing and that's why we encourage what is the first step that you need to do well try this and when you have a shift then we'll take this next step but as long as you're approaching what we do from that perspective, you're going to be a lot more victorious and you're not going to feel defeated, but learning how to train, work co-consciously to cooperate with the inner being of you that is love, to stay down below your feet. Every waking moment of your day is takes a little bit of time and you'll notice that there's no way you can be in your head when you're in the presence of being. Because you learn to listen to the silence, which is down at your solar plexus. There's no reason to think when you're in this IV drip of spirit listening. It's just constantly dripping. It's the only analogy I get. I don't know. I'm like, I'm on an IV over here. I don't know. No, no. (laughs) Definitely on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, I've spent a lot of time, even since I was a kid, um, being fascinated by uh, martial arts. Um, I learned a lot of martial arts because I was afraid all the time. I always pretended to be tough, but on the inside, I was always terrified, you know. So I tried to do some physical martial arts, all sorts of different forms. I was most drawn towards Kung Fu and the Chinese martial arts and the practice of Qigong and Tai Chi. And at the time, practicing it, I didn't understand because I wasn't linked to this internal flow you know and yeah. as as the time goes on and if you like a spiritual awakening happened i started to feel the presence of this flow now and mm-hmm. all that previous information started to link into place you know so i practice a lot of tai chi um you know i'm, I'm a reiki master what whatever these things mean you know but it just means that i can fl- i can sense energy i can yes. pick it up in other people when i work with other people i don't try and i, I don't judge them i just get a sense of really you know, whether we can work together or whether it's time or whatever. And that's how I live my life now. I just mm-hmm. almost like allow my heart to open, the soul to come out, have a feel around, have a bit of a smell and a touch of the taste and whatever, and decide what it wants to do next, you know. And I've lived my life like that for about 30 years now. And, you know, I always, I only ever feel like I'm just scratching the surface, to be honest with you, and learning more and more. But as you say, I think there's never been a time like now where there's almost like an acceleration uh, and and an opening up, if you like. And people, they call them cities or they call them psychic abilities or they call them other senses and stuff. I think, you know, things like telepathy and things that they definitely seem 
to me at least to be increasing exponentially at the moment. Well, you know, and I, you talk about getting into Kung Fu when you were a kid because you were always afraid. Um, I was always afraid too because I felt everything and there were, um, I had, uh, I manifested the bladder infection, the kidney infections all the time from that because I internalized all the negative and intense energy in my environment through my body, my physical body. Um, I chewed my fingernails down to nothing until I befriended the Marlboro Man at like 11 or 12 or something like that. And so it was any way I could calm myself. But before that, you know, you weren't really, you took Kung Fu and what I did, I got so tired of being beat up in my environment, physically, mentally, emotionally, and just everything that I stood in the field at about eight years old, if you've read that part of my book, and I literally took the words of Simon and Garfunkel's, I am a rock, I'm an island. And I surrounded myself like this in the field and said, as a rock feels no pain and an island never cries. And so when I look back at that now, I see how I called upon that consciousness to protect me. And it was not of the light. Yeah. <laughs> it, it gave me a can of whoop ass that said, get in my way and I will destroy you. Yep. because I was so tired of being evicted victim and then uh, you know life went on and on and on and I ended up leaving at 14 and uh, making my way in the world from there and I was around a lot of very clever people uh, a lot of very intelligent people and they were really not of the light and so uh, and I had no idea there was no real energetic difference variance between my home life and transitioning into this these people and so I found that to be interesting in retrospect, too. It's like, gee, there was no variance. And it wasn't until the harmonic convergence in 1988 when, uh, you know, my life was hit, the pain was hitting a threshold in my life. And I was perfect in every way, except internally, I was a, a mess. But I never shared my pain. You know, nobody knew anything. And so when I opened the door to meditation, it was really when the, I, I knew there was a difference there was light all of a sudden and I had never experienced that part of myself and then I realized oh god I mean I can access these other worlds without you know some sort of recreational drug yeah. it was awesome so once I found that then that's been my drug you know meditation and evolution and loving myself more and it really took no time at all it wasn't like I was an addict or anything it was just kind of part of life it was a habit there's a difference between being taken down by an addiction and having it be a habit. And so when I worked with the powers of the bee yeah. that I found, then it was like, just like that. Woke up one morning, didn't smoke again. Just said, hey, I want to quit smoking. This is what it is. Blah, blah, blah. Boom. Done. I just started. I don't even know how I knew. Replacing the habits that I'd been in for years with things that were taking care of Siobhan. Because all I really knew was to how to abuse myself. Yep. Yeah. I just didn't know how to take care of myself. I was never taught that as a child, how to honor myself physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. And so um, the Catholic church is really a detriment to a lot of people uh, because it further creates the division within your mind and your heart. And, uh, you know, and then the parents are only trying to do the right thing by doing what they think is best for you. And uh, did you like my little scapular comment? Did you see that in there? Yes, I saw that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet you did something in the closet like that too there. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I um, at, at, would happen. <laughs> at, at 11, I was sent away to train to be a Catholic priest, you know, because that oh. was the, yeah, yeah. So I remember um, getting on the coach to drive, you know, to be driven 200 miles away from my mum and dad. And then into this place where um, they woke us up at six o'clock in the morning. And we had to start to speak in Latin all the time then, you know. And I, just, I, I like the mass in Latin, quite frankly. Yeah, well, so I, I do too. I do. But the whole point is we had to sort of try and converse in Latin all day long. And it, it was just, it was, it was an experience. And there's, there's lots of things looking back there now that I really enjoyed, but I was terrified all the time. I couldn't go to sleep at night because as soon as I was dropping off, I could see all these things coming through the windows at me and stuff, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I know. And and really clear, clear signs and the, what would be representative these days as sort of um, evil, evil spirits and stuff like that, you know? And we lived, we, we, we all slept in a big open dormitory and stuff. There was lots and lots of things that went on, but I only oh. managed to stay there for 14 months months because I missed my mother more than anything else you know and I, all I was ever doing was crying for my mum you know anyway in the end my dad had to come up and get me take me back home 
And then the bishop uh, said, he wrote to me, uh, or to my mum and dad, and he said, we, he can carry on his priest training anywhere in the world, you know, and I know now, and that's because I was sensitive and mm. I was more sensitive than most there. And I, I, I know this now, I realise it's my emotional sensitivity, really, that they were trying to get hold of for yes. various purposes, you know. We could even call them mm. nefarious purposes. And stuff oh, like yeah. That. It's an ownership of your soul, of the lower part of your soul. And this is how uh, what people want to call darkness works. It's emotional negative energy. And that's why people see it. it it's your visual interpretation. J is the letter of intuition. It's your natural gift. And so you find that people with the letter J in the beginning of their name are very sensitive people and you're one of them. And so you're having this uh, visual interpretation, see, feel kind of a synonymous in your world, I would say, uh, of the energy, the, the emotional energy floating around you and negative energy is emotional energy. And it is the lower part of the soul. When people say soul, there is the spirit, which actually the soul is, but you're not gonna experience the soul as the spirit until you make it conscious, until you transform this lower part. And so when we're, not, we're saying that in truth, the shadow side does not exist. But in the world, it does, because that's the way people interpret life. Yeah. And, and so uh, I'm so glad you were only there 14 months, and I hope they didn't get a hold of you uh, all that much in there. Um, well, to be honest with you, I, it was out of the frying pan into the fire because I then went to a Christian brother's school, which was even more. And, and it, they, what are they we going to do with you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they taught through fear then, right? Yeah, and, oh, yes. and when I was afraid, I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't learn. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. And I was closed down. So I was really, really frightened for a long, long time in my life. Right. Yeah. And I was so closed down. And it's really, I'm a late learner because it's only as I've started to wake up, if you like, and yeah. it's expanded, has all this knowledge come back. So the information was going in. It's still there to be sort of made use of. But at the time when there was any pressure, I couldn't think, you know, so I didn't do very well academically at school because right. of fear, you know. So right. so there was a lot. And, you know, what they used to do there is in order to try and help you to remember, they used to strap you. You know, they give you the strap. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they used to hit you. Yeah. Uh, if you if you couldn't remember, they'd hit you even more, you know, and it's just like when I look back. But there was other things that went on there with the headmaster and those. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they, all those things went on as well, you know. So, um, yeah, I can say that I set myself up really for a really quite an interesting experience, a bit like yourself. Well, I look at it like this, you know, I think to myself and I look back at all the things. Uh, I'm not sure how far you've made it into the book, but through my times in England where my soul history has been there and been the best of the worst. And I helped write the book that the Catholic Church is practicing now. And so this is part of the reason why I feel I came back in. I mean, I've already written the Pope Francis now and said, look, if you want to help reform, I'll move to Rome tomorrow. If you've got the courage, I've definitely got it um, because you've got to know it, not just, yeah. you know, you can't judge it. You've got to, you've got to be standing in it. You've got to let it, you've got to feel it. You've got to let it come at you. You've got to let it bear teeth. You've got to let it should give on its best show because it's bullshit excuse my language and stand there so strongly in the love that you are that nothing can touch you and it's only in judgment that it can get a hold of you because negative emotion needs your fear in order to grip you and as long as you have a judgment toward anything you have this engagement of it and so for me it was having to know what i would be dealing with in my later years to the bone and, uh, you know, as you move along into the last chapter called Redemption, you'll see one of my biggest examples of how I stood toe to toe with it for 18 months um, on a daily basis. And yeah. to transition through part of something that most people can't even relate to. I, I haven't read that bit yet, no, because I, I just skipped through it because I've been that busy, really. But I'm, I'm sure I'll get time it's to fun, read it. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> so, yeah and, and the same again I've, I've been in the most horrendous situations you yes, know and, and you know I, I've 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 come face to face with the demon and it's in, in all its aspects you know and yeah. and I think I think that the power of that comes in now for positive purposes you know I can feel it come in yeah. as a protection for me and I'm almost like fearless now in every single way shape and form you know and I I, I took to the demon drink which which basically 
it disinhibited me so much and all this power came out of you like this this condensed energy it just came out and that was what hooked me back in really so 30 years ago i basically handed my will and my life over to the care of the universe and saying look you can have me i was on the point of death and i yeah. basically said i don't really understand what's going on but i've had enough look take me fully I've had enough. Do with me what you will. And like you said before, I woke up the next day in a completely different world because my consciousness had changed and the fear had all left me. I had nine months where I was basically on cloud nine for nine months, you know, and then I was I was gently lowered back to the ground then and kicked up the bottom to say, right, son, you've experienced what it can be like. Now you've got work to do. Go and show other people how it's done one breath at a time, one step at a time and be simple about it and be practical about it because if it's not practical it's not spiritual and I thought oh thanks very much and that's <laughs> Siobhan, that's what I've done it's one step at a time very simple easy steps and just my, my whole thing is uh, I'm writing a book at the moment like yourself um, it's called the f off approach to health and happiness and f off <laughs> stands for focus on feelings first So what I try and help people to do, much like you, I suppose, is try and help people to come away from their head and back into their body to become more aware aware of the the signals, if you like, that the body's trying to send out and to become much more tuned in to their emotional state and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, what we do is help people be able to feel and and, uh, work with their energy so they're not overwhelmed. So it becomes then an emotion. Because it, working with the energy field is really important as the world continues to appear more divided and more intense in a lot of different ways. And it's going to continue to get that way. And so if you don't have tools, you're going to be really either one side or the, or the other uh, and not to divide. But you can be in right standing in the middle, not caring what one side or the other is doing. But you've got to learn how to manage the energy because we live in a world that everything is energy and energy is everything. So, Yes to be present to what you feel, but make the presence of love present while you're feeling it. So this part of you that is, you know, would otherwise be reacting because of the ungroundedness or the, the uh, love gives you protection without resistance. And so when we talk about working with the energy field, we're talking about working with the loving being that you are. And when you learn how to work with it, like we said earlier, to hold it down below your feet throughout the waking hours of your day, you're contained in the field of love and therefore not thinking, therefore you're not dividing. You're not thinking about what you see or feel. And that is a really important part. It's one of the basic things we teach people in the meditation. You know, it doesn't matter. Love doesn't care. It just loves. And so don't let your mind take you to to divide anything you see or feel. Just be the love that's the observer. And so it keeps you buffered from an angry person who you can very much be aware because you're, you're, you're in the presence of your being of where you feel it within the physical body. And then that gives you the opportunity to identify with the love rather than the condition. In that moment, you're present and talking inwardly to that little part of you that is, you feel the buzz of anger and resonance with this person. Uh, And then you can just let that part of you know, it's okay, I got you, I got you. And so if you feel afraid after that or whatnot, then there's a process that you can take later on in meditation that day and go down to that spot again with the presence of love and transform the energy. Uh, I found that the transformation of the energy made that black cloud leave. I could not, I couldn't understand when I was channeling and just white light to the max and knower of truth, but my life sure didn't reflect what I knew. How this black cloud, how would I, what do I do with this black cloud? And energy doesn't dissipate y'all. It doesn't, you have to transform it. It just goes out. And so people don't realize, well, I'm screaming at so-and-so and I'm like, yeah, and you're becoming part of the problem. You, you're spewing that negative energy back out into the negative field and and it keeps coming bigger and it just loves it when you do that <laughs> yeah no I, I we work in the same way just with different yeah. words i think really you know yeah. and it's a transformational process as you say it's mm-hmm. like a nuclear nuclear implosion 
you know, so I feel that. And rather than it jump from the solar plexus into the head and cause all more reactivity, <laughs> it sort of allow it to transform through the heart. And as it goes up through the, the, the first three dimensions, if you like, for want of a better way, and mm -hmm. up into the higher heart, that it comes out in a different way. And at that point, and this, this is where the hacking physiology to change psychology comes in, mm -hmm. because it's through breathing, we can change the way the heart works to Brilliant. change the way the head works. And therefore it transforms transforms all that sort of condensed emotional energy and it allows it to flow and be useful you know so that that's that's how i explain it to people really yeah and, and as you say there's a personal responsibility to this as well because yeah. things just don't leave uh, to me there's always an experience or if you want a lesson to be learned from why it was condensed and in, in the first place really so it's it almost i see it as bubbles opening up with a sort of ticker tape on the end, you know, like a fortune cookie to say, look, that's what that was about. Sometimes you can just look at it in awareness and understand what it means, and then it dissipates. And yeah. sometimes sometimes there's actually an action that needs to be taken in order for it to happen as well. Well, the great thing is about this work that uh, from when I first started working with it all these 28 years ago and now is that there is no need to remember the story. There is no need. If you're aware that you're angry, deal with how you feel and transform that energy of anger. You don't need to wonder who it came from, how it happened, where it was, because you dissolve all the em negative emotional energy you left here in past lives here. You know, people get really, uh, really fascinated in all these spiritual things that really everybody needs to just stop getting fascinated. It comes down to one thing. It comes down to love. It's pretty freaking simple. Um, get out of your fascinations with things and get down to love. If you feel anger, love the anger in you. Um, if you need to know, I'm always on a need to know basis, pretty much probably like yourself. And so I don't need to know. And if, if I do, it's going to show up. I, I, there's no more this and that and, and blame and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there, yeah, there's a lot of different things in the processes, but the story doesn't matter. It's how you feel. And it never was the story that mattered to begin with, but psychology got you hooked into talking about the story as if that really helps. And look how many people are on drugs now and it going, still going back and nothing's getting solved. And so, yeah, so the story doesn't matter. It's how you felt about what was said, not what was said. It's how you felt about what happened, not what happened. And when people can remember that, they can take everybody off the hook and just be focused on one thing only and loving themselves more. I couldn't agree more. Same, exactly the same. I, 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 yeah, forget the story. The story is not important. Sentimentality is a danger. You know, <laughs> I, I look at sentimentality and stuff like that because sentire means to feel and mental mm -hmm. means to make up with thought. Right. So that's a head trip, really. And, you know, fant fantasy island and sentimentality are a danger. But most people live in that or they'll take yeah. substances like alcohol, for example. It just fueled the fantasy, you know, and, and, and that was the whole thing. And I can see that clearly now. And like you say, I mean, uh, other than talking like this now, um, I hardly say anything at all. I'm, I prefer to be by myself, just feeling my way through stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, I feel great. I mean, um, six months ago, I had a, a heart attack, which nearly saw me off. Right. And, you know, I've kept myself physically fit for a long time. Um, and it just came out of the blue, if there's any such thing as out of the blue. But in the last six months, I've really learned to go much, much deeper and to yeah. un understand the process of energetic alignment through all the yes. different dimensions, you know. So yes. I can see clearly now, if you want to go up to the Higgs field, right, and bring in that and all that sort of stuff, I can see clearly now, and this is what, what my intuition is showing me, about the heart, or if you like, the heart of hearts, being connected to the 12 cranial nerves. Now, I don't know where you're up to with anatomy and physiology, but the cranial nerves mostly operate how the facial muscles work. You know, as my mother used to say, if I pull the face, she'd say, don't, don't pull that face because when the wind changes, you'll stick like that. You know what I mean? But it's, all, it's almost <laughs> as if the way that you hold your face actually determines the way that energy flows throughout your whole body system, you know, and this is why in Taoism and also in the fusion of the five elements, there's this technique called cultivating an inner smile. 
And I think that what that is, is it's an opening of the heart that yeah. allows a release that actually brings a joyful feeling. Now, the smile, though, is inside, you know, <laughs> and I've got I've most of all got this big chuckle going on on the inside. But I look bloody miserable on the outside, you know, and loads of people say to me, smile, for God's sake, will you? It might never happen, you know, but they don't know and they can't feel what's actually going on on the inside. You know? Well, the consciousness is the smile. You know, it's like we do a lot of this with the same work that we apply to humans. We apply to houses because they become a wreck pretty much the same. Yeah. And so when you start to look at how the house is a body and all of this, uh, you know, we work with many houses, but in the houses that I'd live with in as well, you know, the transformation of the house itself is so rewarding because when you come home and you've held and you relate to the walls and your, your abode as the consciousness that it is, it's like it lifts its heart. It's like it opens its chest to you when you walk in the door and it just says, hello, and you feel the, the consciousness of it come to greet you. That's really sacred. That is holding a sacred space. It's not just, you know, throwing a few things around and going, it's done. Uh, so it is, or whatever they say, you know, it's like bullshit. You have to make that conscious. You can know all this stuff all you want. I'm healed. Here's a little, you know, no, there has to be consciousness involved. And, you know, as we spend more time by ourselves and learning how to love ourselves, Joe, I know that this is where our work continues to evolve and how we have more to talk about with people, more to share with our clients, um, you know, that keeps up to speed with the consciousness of the time. There's so many modalities that are ready to come up to this next level of consciousness. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to work with people in ways that you never thought of before as things in the world continue to get more interesting. Well, I do feel that the world is going through its own rock bottom at the moment. And oh, I think- it hasn't, I, hasn't, hasn't quite know, hit there yet in terms no, of- No, no, no. And I think yeah. it's intensifying and uh, the, the sort of external clues are that people are cracking up left, right and center. You know, and, and, I, and I think it's the end of the human intellect or the ability to think our way out of this. And I see a rock bottom, strangely enough, as the ceiling to the next dimension, you know, and, and, and I feel that what's actually happening is people will get to a point that I had to get to myself where I said, look, I can't think anymore. I'm not stupid. I've I've used every bit of brain power that I can. And I just can't think my way out of this anymore. And the idea was right to stop thinking as you say you know so I, I see almost like a it's like a spiral like a drill that the rock bottom's actually drilling a hole if you just sit still long enough then the, it will go up and if you just sit there then you'll be almost like lifted up into the next dimension where the next answers lie really you know and i yeah. and i think I don't think everybody's here to evolve, uh, you know, where everybody's evolving, no matter what it looks like. Some people are just taking a really slow and dark path to get there. And that could have been me if I wasn't born here to wake up and become cultured throughout these decades in order to be able to help people uh, excel at a much greater rate. I had, you know, I'm, 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 you know, people go, oh, we've gone through so much. And I'm like, I don't feel any of that. It's been like childbirth. I have transformed so much within my physical body that it doesn't vibrate in me the same way. Those stories are only used for teaching purposes and there's no charge with them at all. And so, you know, it becomes different, but I, you know, to help people right now awaken their consciousness, uh, jack them up, if you will, with the light and give them an opening if they're willing to do the work and take it one little step at a time, uh, they can get pretty far pretty quickly if they're on the fast track. Some people have just waited until this time. And part of my, one of my jokes is, gee, if I'd have known I could have waited till now just to, <laughs> to just do it now. And then I'm thinking, no, I'd have been dead. So, you know, it's okay. No, no, um, I, no, I, I agree. And I, and I see that sort of, um, I don't see a sort of linear vertical type model like Jacob's Ladder that people talk about. I correct. see it as a sort Sort of a sphere and some people can actually they can actually complete one part of it and like cross train and everything else lights up then because that's the you know so so i i see it in a similar sort of a way but what i've been given is clearly is i get that the at the core let's call it the heart it's attached to these 12 cranial nerves then what i'm being shown in my mind is that those cranial nerves then are attached to the meridians 
the meridians go further out then there's all sorts of cosmic attachments that happen then so there's like the 12 disciples then the 12 tribes you know so there's all symbology associated with all this stuff now where i find myself is it's almost like i'm like uh, oscar schindler in the enemy's camp i'm right in the middle of traditional medicine right uh, Tra yeah. tr you know and and so that's I know that I'm supposed to be there, but I'm, I'm supposed to be a neuroscientist, but I'm being fed all the time with this sort of future information and yes. trying to translate it and talk mm -hmm. in neuroscientific terms, you know, and it, it is working really. And um, I think, you know, I think you talk about in some bits, uh, neurogenesis and new neural pathways and stuff, you know, well, mm -hmm. that's, that's coming into science much more quickly now. And here's a good one for you. I was given a word. Well, the I am approach, I, I just woke up one morning and I said, Joe, you've got to be teaching about the I am approach. He said, OK, then what's that mean? Internal asset management. OK, then what does that mean? And that's to help people focus on the strengths that they were born with, their innate abilities, get mm -hmm. them to allow those gifts to come to the fore. That will give them self-confidence then to go forward. And in time, it will help them to transform, if you like, the negative sides of their characters. So it's to work with what's strong in them first, not what's wrong with them. It's completely the opposite way around that the Western world works, because that's always sort of focusing on defects. And this I think to teach them that there's nothing wrong with the defect it helps them be easier on themselves and they find themselves more easy to love. It's like if they have to look at something they judge it as being horrible, they're going to run. And so it, it is the it's the language of the consciousness of love that that helps people so much. And, uh, you know, as people in the psychological field, in the neuroscience field and things, there, there's a lot of science to what I do, though I'm not a scientist. And I would love the opportunity to be. Um, uh, the subject of the emotional energy transformation, you know, to a machine, if that can happen, to where we can physically demonstrate that there is something actually occurring. I would love to be the, you know, the, what do you call it, uh, lab rat for that. <laughs> well, funnily enough, I'm working on work. It, there's something called a squid device, which is a super quantum interface device. You know, mm. and, and I'm trying to I'm trying to wangle my way in there while well, I'm being navigated in there slowly but surely. And so I'm in that same position. But most of my stuff now is to do with electrical information. But mm. I believe that the transformation for me, at least, is a magneto electric effect. I see that it's it's actually associated with the the, the sacred feminine energy that's sweeping across the planet. This, that's how I see this thing anyway, which is which is, if you like, is um, a heart-based energy or, or a deeper energy that's mm -hmm. coming out now to redress the balance. So once again, it's almost like resetting the patriarchal system into a more balanced system. It's not that the feminine's taking over. It's just that the feminine's more nurturing, more intelligent. I'll say that again, that the feminine's more intelligent, right, than the masculine, because that's a bit like a bit of a lumbering sort of a worker. And I think that's, in my mind, that's what I'm being shown. So really, it's to get out of the way, take the head off, throw it away and allow it to come through and do the transformation. Yes. I don't believe that we do the transformation. No, I we think don't. that we're, we're being transformed if we can only get out of the way and stop the over analysis of what's going on. Right. And, you know, I, I was thinking that there was a joke that came to me not too long ago. The meek will inherit the earth because the other ones are going to be trying to figure out how to get out of the way. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't beyond the feminine and masculine. I is the oneness of it all. I, I feel that, you know, higher consciousness, God consciousness is it. And it knows no gender. I think it's the conditioning of the male that makes him what the male is. And I feel that it's the conditioning of the female. And these are the patterns that we're breaking within ourselves. Um, I, I, you know, I have, uh, I feel strength in me. The, there is a depth to my spirit, the sword of truth, which is what it is and manifested within me. I, was told in 1993 that I would become the sword itself. And I had no idea what that meant at the time. Uh, there was, you know, I had a three-year-old daughter and all these things that I went through all the way to discover this consciousness that was living within the love that I learned how to become within myself. It is discovering the spirit, which even gives love life within the, you know, within the being that you are. So it, we look at things 
the language of separation is what you get over in the consciousness of God or of the, the oneness, they call it, the thing. And so, but where you, you are in helping people utilize what you're talking about, they understand that language. And so that's where you have to give it to them and then help them evolve to the language getting beyond the barriers of gender and race and all of it. And we hang on to that stuff so much. Uh, it's so funny, you know, everybody, I'm just not spiritually correct, you know? Mm. Oh, no, neither am I most of the time. But I think in the field that I'm in, I've got to use this language of duality. And I talk oh. about left left and right yes. hemisphere asynchronization. And then they all pick up then what's he going on about? And then I'll talk about triangulation at the level of the heart. You know. Well, I tell you what, I would love to you get that squid thing going on. Yeah. What, what I will, I'll, I'll let you know. Do do do. I'll come over and see you. We'll have some great fun. Um, one of the things that I'm writing about in my book and I really believe is happening, but yet there's got to be a, a way. Well, I know there's a way, I just don't know what it is because I'm not a scientist, but I feel that through this process within myself of coming together and not more functioning from one or other, but from one, that the corpus callosum is actually where it is active. It, it, I don't function left or right. I function from the center of the, the nerve endings that, that are connected to the two as the yeah. one. So it's the corpus callosum that is actually active in my brain. And you know that, do you know that? How yeah, yeah, I know that. I see that clearly, that it's that you? Oh my God, thank you for knowing that. I think it sounds so fringe and it's in my book, you know, it's like what oh. I've realized. I I I was shown that quite some time back that's the corpus callosum the middle pillar that will bring those two sort of fragments together and that's called it's a, it's a move this is what I get so we've been in a situation for eons of time in accentuated antagonism we've been yeah. living in fear and threat so we've been living on the defensive when we let go we let go of both those polarities and it's almost like there's a vertical sweep that goes up and at the corpus callosum it's like a telegraph pole it's got yes. various nodes on it, right? Yes. And I think there's 12 dimensions, right? But there's another five, there's another three dimensions in the primal light fields. See, I've been introduced to all these things called Merkaba mechanics now. And it's okay. Also, yeah, but you you've know, been, yeah, using the Merkaba for about 13 years. Yeah, well, I, so, so me too, really. And, and the Kabbalah as well, or the Kabbalah, there yes. was a t 10 sphere, that's the old hat one, because when the two other spheres came on, it brought it back to the 12 spheres of consciousness. And so all this has been given to me. And so really, like you say, I, I believe totally in that unified sort of consciousness. It's almost like a choiceless awareness. So if there's no choice and just pure awareness, it everything, just is. It just is. Exactly. <laughs> And another word that I can't use or won't use, right, because I've tried it and got, I can't use love in neuroscience and medicine at the moment because they just won't have it. If I say, really, it's all about unconditional love, right, they just close down immediately. So, mm -hmm. so I've had to learn to be a bit sort of under the radar and bring stuff in, really. Scientific, sure. So if, um, all right, so it can be reduced, love can be reduced for the sake of a better word, to a frequency. And so people believe that just taking that frequency and pointing at something that they're judging as needing to, you know, that creates division in the experience already. This needs to be healed. Well, the consciousness of love never saw anything other than its whole self and in that it was healed. So there is no seeing something that needs to be healed and using that frequency. And, and this is the language people are going to have to within themselves, you know, it's not about downloading it, but you have to experience this in order to um, make it real for you. There's so much we know, but until, you know, when I was told, when I was literally told in a reading by this person that the beings that I was channeling were governing the information at this particular point because they wanted me to learn that I was what I was seeking outside of myself. Now, I had been white light channeling, pretty impressive, uh, if I don't say, if I do say so myself, and all this, you know, ego that goes along with that. And I remember hissing at my recorder because I was, I, I knew on a, such a deep level, I could not ignore what I was hearing. And that golden light was the key to being, to my own wholeness, which then I realized so many years later was that, you know, 
duality is the door, love is the key, and you know, God is the revelation. So uh, however you do that in scientific terms, that's the track you're on. Um, I, I don't know it really in scientific terms, but um, so you'd have to use the word frequency in your work. Is that how you say it or? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying to them now, and they're still very much stuck in the 3D electrical model, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. phenomenology and they uh, got to see it to believe it and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll yeah. talk about electricity and I'll mm -hmm. try and break it down then into, into you know, atomic, subatomic, quantum atomic, stuff. So, yeah. so they're bringing sure. quantum in now. So we, we use things like functional um, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And I say to them, well, how does that work then, you see? And so uh -huh. they use these devices all the time. So they can, we can introduce them then into frequencies and how frequencies work to affect changes. But something else that's coming in now is it's the use of, um, let me just get this now. It's the use of light. It's called optogenetics, really. And it's different frequencies of light that impact mm -hmm. upon different neural pathways that cause different changes to happen at stem cells. That's where I'm into now. It's epigenetics and it's the use of light frequency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the use of light frequencies really to affect changes at a cellular level. And this is where, where stem cell therapy is coming in now. So but I just do that more at an organic level then is what you're saying. I, I have always, I don't even know what stem cells do, but I've always said, yay, stem cells. I know something about them being correct i don't know what it is well it's a bit like source itself if you take source as one cell really then mm -hmm. it differentiates then you know it differentiates into different levels then and i think that that's how i see quantum physics in the same sort of way it's a different so there's a there's a um totally potential stem cell if you like call that source itself mm -hmm. and then it yeah. differentiates then into totally potentiality and then it becomes more specialized as it goes down then and sort of and then eventually then it sort of materializes then so i i try and take them backwards then from the cell that's in the body because as within so without and all that sort of business i'm trying to help them to understand that yoga have known about these cycles of changes for a long long time yes. these these happen in our bodies called circadian variations you know and it's all based upon the activity of the pineal gland you see so the yes. pineal glands coming back online and there's something in the pineal gland called the suprachiasmatic nucleus and that's basically it's the timing device of the body that that is activated or not by light so lots of people are working in artificial light now there's a lot of sickness involved with the fact that we're out of daylight um you know activation and night interesting so much stuff i'm going to send you um i'll send you a pdf by a professor called stephen poor thank right. you thank you and, so much and he's he's he talks about love Right. He talks about love and he sort of got nearly struck off for this, you know, but he's basically saying that love is an emergent philosophy in mammalians. And what it means is that as it expands, it impacts upon the body in different ways. Now, he talks about the duality of the, um, the, the masculine and feminine, but I can clearly see where he's going. Mm -hmm. But his work's loved by a minority and hated by the majority, you see. But I'll, I'll send you this. Love Thank as an, you. Yeah. Thank, one thing I, I got to say is that you can't speak of love, right? And I'm not a scientist, so I can't speak to the science of it. Because I, I learn the science as it is delivered to me through my experience. Because I don't read other people's books. I never have. I've come to everything that I know and what I do organically. And so that is why, you know, it's, it's exciting to me to, uh, to think about being tested in a way, I, you know, that can show that it works without science, that we are the science itself. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I How think fun. That is a... oh, it's just so fun to be alive right now, isn't it? Well, <laughs> absolutely. And I think I I read now for confirmation, not information, you know, exactly. and I, I, I can exactly. see that and I, I'll sort of get um, a, a nudge to pick up a book and open it, exactly. it could be anything and it'll go, there we are, that's what you're looking at, thank you very much. You and know. you put the book away and you never look at it again. Absolutely. Yeah, that's my thing too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After all so, these years, yep. Yeah. Yep. So I think now I'm, I'm where I'm up to now is I trust wholeheartedly the feelings that emerge from me. Yes. Uh, and I try and listen to it. I use my left ear. I listen in to sort of say, mm -hmm. give it, give me that clearly. What do you, what is, and then 
I say, do you want me to act on this? And if I get if I get like a push, right, it's almost like take some action or no, we're just giving you information that you might need tomorrow. You know, I know that you know what I'm talking about here, really. That's fantastic. Oh, my gosh. It's been such a delight to chat with you, really. And um, it just really has been. And thank you for everything, your courage to follow your path and do what's being asked. That's one thing we help people do is listen and obey. <laughs> That's a real switch flipper when they hear that. They're like, obey, what do you mean? I'm like, you'll understand one day and it won't become such a resistance. Well, word. exactly. And but, you know, we'll have to have another chat further down the line, you know, because we, we never will. got we never got to talk about listening and, uh, and obeying mothers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're coming up to time more or less now, Siobhan. So yes. just before we go, my, my sort of feelings for uh, setting up this channel was just to... Um, maybe help people with a simple bit of practical advice sort of something simple that they could maybe go away with and practice which might help them to sort of tune in have you got any um, anything that comes to mind um to help them with listening or just i don't know to to help them with getting in touch if you like with their intuition or their inspiration something yes, that well, might I tell you what I'll do if if it, this is it's kind of a, a longer than two minutes thing and it's really the, the premise for the work that we do is is learning how to ground your energy and to work with the spirit consciously in the body and so there are ways that we give you so we'll give you this so when you wake up in the morning people often just take that for granted they don't understand what's actually happened that spirit that loving beautiful golden orb of you came back into your body to wake you up and we never a lot of people don't even show it any respect it's like hello <laughs> so Give thanks to the spirit coming back in your body. Uh, let it know straight from the beginning. Listen, I want to change this program. I need you to stay down below my feet every waking moment of the day. And then work with a, a grounding golden light meditation. If anybody wants to get a hold of me after this, I'll be happy to gift you one. Just, just get a hold of me, sovereignmastery at gmail.com. I'll be happy to, to put one in the email for you uh, to get you started. But in addition to the meditation, just not thinking about what you see, not thinking about what you feel, working with the spirit to stay down in the body, not only when you're meditating, but throughout your day, uh, tuning your mind from its busyness to the center where it is my left ear as well, that I just kind of, it's like it cocks itself and I'm listening <laughs> to the silence and you interpret whatever the silence is conveying. And so, yeah, work with being grounded. And when you're grounded, you can't think. So if you're thinking, then you know you're not grounded. That's a pro tip there. Um, work with those tools. So we would love to be able to gift you a golden light meditation to get you started and um, just work with your spirit consciously. And like knowing myself, I had to be really hard on myself. I wanted that program changed. And so um, I talked to my spirit like, hey, I need you to stay down below my feet. I can't do anything spirit wants me to do in life. I can't fucking function. I can't da -da 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 -da. stay below my feet. And so that's the understanding we had and then it becomes self-awareness and when you you know become self-aware then you become um, more aware of the subtleties and the nuances and, and you can make these adjustments very quickly so marvelous <laughs> marvelous i wake up as soon as i wake up in the morning i say um before i open my eyes i open my heart yep i tap on my heart like that and i say that's nice. What's on the cards today, chaps? <laughs> right. Because my, my approach these days is very lighthearted. Yes. But I call it seriously lighthearted because I know <laughs> I know that there's a, a responsibility that goes with this as well, you know. Yeah. Siobhan, God bless you, love. Thanks very much indeed. Thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Thank I'll you. send I'll send you that thing and uh, hopefully we Thank can you. do another one of these in a couple of months' time or something. I would love that. Give a hug to your mum for me. <laughs> Will do. And um, speak to you soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.